everyone. My name is Lindsay Brown. I'm a nutrition mentor and registered dietitian here at Basics Market. And thank you for joining me for the anti-inflammatory diet. I am super excited about this topic. And I hope you can walk away with several practical things that you can do within your diet to help um, reduce inflammation and lead a healthier life. Um, before we get started, a couple things. I want to just talk a little bit about Basics Market. Oh, first, questions. If you have any questions, please um, use the chat function um, or you can email us at basicsmarket.com or excuse me, uh, the video will be posted on basicsmarket.com um, and then you can submit your chat questions during the presentation or you can wait till um, after the presentation has been concluded to share your questions. Okay, a little bit about Basics Market. Basics Market is a locally owned market with a purpose, nurturing strong, healthy communities through food with simplified selection, fresh ingredients, and helpful recipes. Our five locations in the Portland area are small and accessible, focused on just what you need to cook helpful meals at home. And before I get started, I always like to mention to please check with your healthcare provider before changing anything in your diet. Um, just if you have further questions that you want to ask and clarify before introducing anything new, but always recommend that. Okay, so just a quick overview of the um, topics that we're going to discuss in this presentation. So we're going to talk about inflammation, the different types of inflammation, go a little bit into what a pro-inflammatory diet looks like, and then the three nutrients that I really wanted to focus on um, to in tonight's presentation, there are more nutrients out there that are anti-inflammatory um, and have anti-inflammatory properties, but I really wanted to focus on these three because of the significant research behind them and the practicality for you to implement them. So those are um, the reasons why I selected these. So the first nutrient that we're gonna highlight is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, the second one is anthocyanins and monounsaturated fats are gonna be the last one. Um, before I conclude, I'm going to do a recipe, um, which is the fennel radicchio and dive salad with Dijon vinaigrette. And that is a salad that a recipe that is featured on our recipe wall this month. So if you come into one of our five locations, you'll be able to find the salad recipe. Um, a nice card that you can take home, or you can visit our website for the recipe, as well as the how-to video. If you're more into the video um, visual component, then you can look at the how-to videos for the short recipe video. Okay, so inflammation, the different types. Uh, inflammation is not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually the first line of defense for acute inflammation type events. So acute inflammation is something that only lasts for maybe a few hours to a few days. And again, this is our first line of defense to help our body heal. Our body has um, you know, white blood cells and make special white blood cells to produce leukocytes. And these leukocytes go to that area of injury to help start that healing process. So inflammation um, in, in itself, it's actually a good thing. But when that acute inflammation goes into that chronic stage, lasting months to years, that's when there are more repercussions to that inflammation. So acute is short, few day, you know, a few hours to a few days. This is the first line of defense. And examples of that would be like a cut or a burn, or if you have a cold, um, or sprained ankle. Those are all types of acute inflammation. And you will have swelling or irritation or redness or not feel great when you have these types of acute inflammation. And that is actually, you might not feel great, but that's actually a good thing. That tells you that your body's immune system is, is working and that is, that is good. Now, chronic inflammation, like I was saying, this lasts months to years. And with, with chronic inflammation, it can be caused by different things. It can be environmental toxins. So if you're constantly exposed to certain toxins, that can create chronic inflammation. 
um, different health conditions. That's gonna create chronic inflammation. I'll go a little bit more into depth on that. Your diet, stress. I know we all have been very stressed this past year. And so helping control stress levels is very important also to help reduce chronic inflammation. Um, lack of exercise and movement. Again, those, those are all things that can promote that chronic inflammatory state. And over time, those leukocytes, those white blood cells, um, can damage tissue if you're chronically um, asking for them to, to come to that site or um, have that response mechanism going on. So over time, that can damage healthy tissue. Um, and there's a lot of other things that are going on. I'm not going to go into to depth with because there are a lot of things that we don't understand with chronic inflammation. There's a lot of research going out there with, um, you know, exactly how does it how does it work? Why? And, you know, some cases we don't understand necessarily the cascade effect with it. So um, there are a lot of things that we, we don't understand, but there are some things that we do and diet can definitely help. And research has shown that it can help um, control that chronic inflammation and decrease risk of certain diseases that are linked to chronic inflammation. So such as cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, neurological diseases, autoimmune diseases, and cancer. These are things that we can maybe help decrease the chances of through diet, through helping um, you know, expose our, our body and our cells to things that are going to help reduce that inflammation response within our body. So I'm gonna move on to the first nutrient that I'm really wanting to focus on. Um, but before that, the um, pro-inflammatory diet, I did wanna just put a quick little diagram up here. I think most of us know that with pro-inflammatory foods, what where those might come from. But you know, things that are refined um, in sugar, they are fried, they are um, you know, high in, in maybe sodium, uh, desserts that are going to be high in simple um, sugars and refined grains, sugary drinks, these are all things that can promote inflammation through different you know, responses within the body. So we're consuming things that are higher in, in sugar or refined grains, which eventually will get to um, sugar, then our blood sugar rises. And there is a correlation to blood sugar and having um, uncontrolled blood sugar levels or high blood sugar levels chronically that can lead to different side effects, um, especially with increasing risk of heart disease, um, as well as maybe cognitive decline. So these types of foods, I do want to mention that they are okay to consume in small amounts um, because food should be something that we enjoy. And I don't like to consider myself the food police. And I know a lot of dietitians out there that don't um, like to be labeled that. And so with pro-inflammatory foods, it's one of those things that, yes, you can incorporate into your life. But I like to kind of um, categorize them as something like that, that on a special occasion um, that you might want to do um, that, on, again, like a special occasion with somebody, um, with a friend, a family member, something that has that sentimental value for you. Um, but if you do it more often, then it doesn't, to me, become as special. So I think for, for these type of foods, um, definitely, you know, it's not one of those things I'm saying completely cut out because let's be honest, that's pretty unrealistic for, for most of us. Um, but it's one of those things that too, just in moderation, small amounts, that is okay to do. Okay, first nutrient I want to focus on is um, omega-3 fatty acids. And there's three different types of omega-3 fatty acids that I want to um, go into a little bit more of where those come from. Um, and then I'm gonna go into like the health benefits and how much should you try to aim for. Because I really want you to walk away from this presentation with um, practical tools that you can use to help improve your diet. 
So the first type of omega-3 fatty acid is um, alkalinolenic acid, and that's ALA. And this is going to be found in plant sources. And so I have different examples up here. Uh, flaxseed is an excellent source of um, ALA, omega-3 fatty acids. And with flaxseed, what I really like about it, and same with hemp hearts are also an excellent source. With these two items, these are great to, I kind of call it sneak in. Um, you can sprinkle it on top of your cereal. You can use it in uh, baked goods, desserts. There's actually a couple recipes online, uh, how-to recipes, uh, the cranberry orange sweet bread, and then a lemon blueberry snack cake, where I use the flaxseed mill in place of eggs to increase the nutrient content and fiber. So it's a really great egg replacement for baked goods, if you wanna try it out that way. But again, it's something that can be easily incorporated without you really knowing it. Uh, also smoothies, both of them fantastic to add into smoothies. Uh, and again, not really knowing that they're there. Other food sources that are great in ALA, soybeans. I do get some questions about soy products in, in general, but um, they are a great source of ALA. So um, they do have anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Uh, we also have, um, like I was saying, the hemp hearts and then chia seeds. With chia seeds, uh, this is great chia pudding, simple, you know, easy to make. Um, there's a lot of different recipes out there for it. So uh, it's, it's a, a really quick, easy breakfast or snack item you can do. Uh, also avocados have a little bit of ALA in them as well. Um, the other two types of omega-3 fatty acids, we have DHA and EPA. And these two types are gonna be found in seafood. And so different types of seafood that um, I would recommend are going to be salmon, tuna, herring, uh, trout has it, oysters, mackerel. These are all excellent sources of DHA and EPA. And I wanted to specifically put the can out here because you don't, it doesn't have to be fresh. And um, canned is a great affordable option for getting omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so canned tuna, canned salmon, sardines, these are all totally acceptable, great ways to incorporate uh, more omega-3 fatty acids if you're not wanting to do fresh seafood. So great option. So the health benefits of consuming omega-3 fatty acids, um, there's been a lot of research with omega-3 fatty acids especially with in the Mediterranean um, diet, because Mediterranean diet is higher in um, fat in general, mainly unsaturated fats, and they consume more seafood. Uh, but cardiovascular wise, that has been a really uh, focus of research with omega-3 fatty acids, probably since the mid 1990s. So there's a lot of great established research out there that shows that consuming people who consume more omega-3 fatty acids decreased risk of cardiovascular disease in general. Um, and also great benefit with uh, consuming omega-3 fatty acids from a cardiovascular standpoint is helping with cholesterol levels. So um, triglycerides in particular, they're really finding that omega-3 fatty acids really help control and reduce triglyceride levels. It may slightly increase HDL levels, but the greatest impact is going to be on your triglyceride levels. Um, and then more research has been kind of shifting towards like pregnancy in the womb, fetal development, brain development, eye development. Um, and they have, you know, shown some great, uh, you know, great health benefits for babies while they're developing of um, brain development and retina development. Uh, so that's another great benefit. So if you're pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant, omega-3 fatty acids, and I'll have a little bit more on the next slide about well, how much for when you are pregnant to aim for, um, but they're a fantastic um, nutrient to incorporate. Uh, they also help you know, decrease risk of cancer. There has been research on prostate and breast cancer. 
it's a little bit, the jury's kind of still out on some um, of it, but there has been um, some research that has shown to help decrease uh, risk in both of those and um, somewhat in colorectal as well. Um, also, it helps um, maybe decrease the risk of cognitive decline, Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, I think that's more of a hot topic research um, area in probably the last maybe five, maybe a little bit more years, but um, it seems like there is more uh, research and interest in cognitive, how omega-3 fatty acids impact cognitive um, health within adults as well you know, as you age. So again, some really interesting research coming out in that area. And then it also might help manage the pain with um, people who have RA, rheumatoid arthritis. So it might help them reduce using a medication to help control the pain. So they have found a correlation or a link to omega-3 fatty acid intake and pain reduction within people who have RA. Okay, so how much omega-3 fatty acid? Um, currently, the American guidelines um, do not have specifically the um, DHA and EPA uh, intake, daily intake of, of um, omega-3 fatty acids. They do talk a little bit about ALA. Um, they do have established recommendations for that, and that varies based off of, off of age. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, you know, just general recommendations from other sources that are a little bit more practical. And so the first one I want to talk about is the American Heart Association, so AHA. They recommend one to two servings of three ounces of omega-3 rich foods a, a week. And so again, omega rich foods can include your fatty fish, um, the ALA sources. And I do wanna uh, mention with ALA, omega-3 fatty acids, our bodies do not convert because it does have to be converted into the more active form, EPA and DHA. And our bodies don't do a great job at that. So I wanna note that, but that doesn't mean you can't get um, any omega-3 fatty acids through that. But I do, you know, just want to mention that um, it does have to convert. And during that conversion process, it does lose some of its potency of the um, omega-3 content. But it doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't consume it. Um, and people who are vegan or vegetarian that might not consume, you know, seafood, um, then that is going to be, you know, an excellent source for you. But aim for one to two servings, three ounces a day, and that's through the American Heart Association for cardiovascular benefits. For pregnancy, the National, National Institute of Health, they recommend eight to 12 ounces of low mercury containing seafood per week. And they say this may improve baby's health. In particular, you know, the research has focused on fetal brain development and retina development. So eight to 12 ounces of low mercury um, containing food. So low mercury um, salmon is perfect. Sardines are both considered low mercury. Tuna is gonna be a little bit higher, um, but salmon and sardines are gonna be low mercury containing seafood. And then the MIND diet recommendations and the MIND diet, which I, I hope that I can do a presentation on that uh, later months, but the MIND diet is a diet that was developed to study cognitive health or decline or decreasing the risk of cognitive decline through Alzheimer's and dementia. And with the MIND diet, they combined the Mediterranean diet, which is probably one of the most um, researched established diets out there, along with the DASH diet, which is probably a little even more research. Um, it, they've been around for many, many years. And, and so they combined both of those diets and recommendations and created the MIND diet. And with the MIND diet, they have one serving of three to five ounces per week of a, um, a omega-3 uh, rich food for cognitive health. So I think for recommendations, something that you can maybe set a goal for is if you don't consume 
omega rich foods on a um, weekly basis, then start there. Start consuming, you know, one a week. Um, if you consume seafood, designate one meal a week that has three to five ounces of a rich omega-3 fatty acid seafood in it. If you're not a seafood fan, then incorporate more, I would say more often, because like I said, the ALA doesn't really convert all the way through to the active DHA and EPA forms. So if you want to do flaxseed, chia seed, hemp seed, you know, put them on your cereal, put a tablespoon on your cereal in the morning or make chia pudding for a snack. Do those things maybe a little bit more regular, knowing that um, introducing it more often is going to get you a little more because you're not going to be converting it to the active form. So those are some recommendations that you can establish for yourself. So the second nutrient that I want to focus on are anthocyanin. Um, and these are going to be types of flavonoids that give that red, so red and purple, bluish colors that you see in vegetables and fruit. And so I have some examples here. Berries are obviously at the top of the list when we think of red, blues, purples. Uh, so berries, um, but vegetables too. So vegetables such as the red cabbage, uh, radicchio, which I'm gonna be using in the salad. Um, those are all fantastic sources of the anthocyanins as well. Um, but they're easy, you know, again, talking about like different health benefits and how we can consume them and how much, um, hopefully can find some easy ways to incorporate those on a regular basis. Um, I also wanted to point out too, I had um, some frozen berries here. And with uh, frozen berries, we're kind of entering, we're getting closer to berry season in Oregon. And I know most of you are um, maybe looking forward to that and, and uh, I am as well. But if you're wanting to incorporate berries that are local and, and seasonal, but it's in the middle of winter, then frozen berries are gonna be a fantastic option for you. They're also maybe more affordable as well um, during, you know, when things are out of season. So I really recommend frozen berries because people do ask questions between, well, do you lose, you know, nutrient content when you freeze it? And pretty much the answer is no. And sometimes they say, or, you know, they can argue that it might have more nutrient content because they're picking or harvesting them closer to when they are um, totally ripened. And, and, you know, there is debate when that happens, is there more nutrients or not? But you can, you know, say, be safe to know that they are picking them closer to when they ripen versus something that is being shipped from thousand miles away. So I really recommend the frozen um, route when. Yeah, we have a question. Do beets also fit in this category? Oh, yes, they do. So, yeah, anything that has that red, purple, blue color is going to fit within the anthocyanins, or the, it's going to contain anthocyanins. So beets are in there, and beets go off topic a little bit, but I like to talk about it. Um, beets are high in nitric oxide. So nitric oxide um, helps vasodilate our blood vessels. So it means it helps expand them and it helps with oxygen delivery to our tissue um, and it can help you know support cardiovascular health and blood flow so that's just a little tidbit on beets uh, but back to uh, health benefits of anthocyanins there we go uh, they have shown that they can help lower blood pressure and going kind of back to the beets they have shown um, to help with um, uh, vas vascular health and um, the, the elasticity of your blood vessels. So that's a really cool thing. And, um, and reduce you know, certain types of cancer, cancer growth. I think there's definitely some more research that needs to be done within, within this area. Um, and there, there is, and I know that there's a lot of focus with with utilizing anthocyanins and, and um, how it impacts cancers 
tumor growth and those types of things. But they are showing some early promising results um, of exposing those cells to anthocyanins. So I'm really excited about you know, the future of that research. Uh, support vision health. It help, may help decrease risk of cardiovascular disease, um, support cognitive and motor health. Um, and, and again, when, I, when I'm talking about all this, I'm not specifically saying decreases inflammation because these types of things are inflammation, right? Um, so if we can help control blood sugar, we can help control blood pressure, those types of things create inflammation or that chronic inflammation in our body. Um, and again, these are a great nutrient to incorporate. So how much? Um, the MIND diet, going back to the MIND diet and those recommendations, it has five or more one half servings per week of berries. They specifically say berries um, in the study. And not saying that you know, red cabbage and radicchio or beets um, want to have that same impact. I think that's what um, they wanted to maybe focus on within that, um, with, within the anthocyanin group. And so berries were, uh, were specifically pointed out. Um, also, there was a 2019, so recent study on cardiometabolic study. And with the cardiometabolic study, they took individuals who were at high risk of developing metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is another condition that creates chronic inflammation in the body. And that's where um, you have high um, blood pressure, so hypertension, um, higher cholesterol levels. Uh, you have um, increased fat around the abdomen area. And uh, so that will put you at uh, increased risk of developing other um, chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So they took people who were at higher risk of developing um, this metabolic syndrome, and they found that if they consume one cup of blueberries, um, about 150 grams is what they, they pointed out, and daily, that they actually decreased their chance of cardiovascular disease by 15%. And the study was only six months. So I, I just kind of think, wow, if, if that was just in a six month time, I will have to agree, you know, a cup of berries a day, that is a commitment. Like you have to be a little bit more conscientious of that. But I think, wow, you know, 15% in six months for people who have already who already has chronic inflammation going on, I think that is amazing results, to be honest. And so um, that's why I wanted to, to share that with y'all because I thought that was a really uh, favorable result with, with just food, no medication, just food. So, okay, our last nutrient that I wanna focus on before we get into the uh, um, recipe are monounsaturated fats. And monounsaturated fats, you're going to have a nice selection over here. Um, but they have one carbon compound. And basically what that means is that they're going to be liquid. You know, they're liquid at, at room temperature versus butter or lard, saturated fats. They're going to be solid at room temperature. So um, different examples are going to be olive oil, canola oil, we got hot flour oil, peanut, um, peanut oil. So a lot of oils are great in monounsaturated fats. Also have seeds and nuts. A lot of the, the things um, that I talked about with omega-3 fatty acids also have monounsaturated fats in them as well. Um, nuts, we, a lot of nuts have, I guess, a combination of fatty acids in them. Um, but ones that are a little bit higher in monounsaturated fats are going to be like pistachios and pecans, um, peanuts, which is a legume, but um, seeds, pumpkin seeds, and sesame seeds, those are going to have um, high, higher amounts of monounsaturated fats in them. And then avocados. Avocados are amazing in monounsaturated fats. So um, those are all great ways that you can get it in and, and a, you know a variety as well and easy so with these these are these are cooking oils and with you know cooking oils you know just um 
you know, toss it. If you're you know, searing a chicken, put a little bit of olive oil in it. Or if you're you know, making a salad, like we're going to do here in a little bit, um, use olive oil as a base. And that's going to be an easy way to get in those monounsaturated fats. Um, another thing with, with fats, uh, I really wanted to highlight, because sometimes fat isn't necessarily shown in the best light, but they do a lot of great things in our body to help control inflammation and to help us um, just stay healthy. And with, with fats, they really help, um, one, to help our bodies um, produce hormones or the building blocks of our hormones. They also help the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. So D, A, K, and E, those are all fat-soluble vitamins that these type of fats are gonna help you absorb and stay healthy. So just wanted to put that in there. Got another question? Yeah, one, we have a question about if all of these oils are equal. We wanted to know if like is canola oil or olive oil comparable is one healthier than the other? Good question, because we're just gonna um, cover that for um, how much. So I will I will save that when we get to the next slide after I talk about the health benefits. So, um, but health benefit wise, so monounsaturated fats, this is a, uh, another big nutrient that is a part of the Mediterranean diet. And so again, this has been studied for, the Mediterranean diet has been studied for 30 plus years. Um, so well-established research and, and, and they find with, within the Mediterranean diet, um, majority of, of fat is coming from unsaturated sources from mono and polyunsaturated as well as omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and so they have found with replacing, it's really important to understand that if you replace saturated fat within the diet with monounsaturated fat, that's going to help lower your LDL cholesterol levels they have found. Um, so LDL is the, the bad cholesterol that you want to, to lower. And then it might slightly improve the HDL levels as well. Um, but the important key to that is you have to replace some of the saturated fat within the existing diet they have found. Um, they also found that it helps improve um, insulin sensitivity. And this is both in people who have no issues with insulin sensitivity um, or utilizing insulin or have insulin resistance, such as people with um, type two diabetes. But they found like people that just have, you know, that react completely normal and stuff, they might be able to use their insulin a little bit better. And then also people who have insulin resistance. Um, they found with monounsaturated fat, replacing some of the saturated fat with monounsaturated fat, it helps improve that insulin sensitivity. And when that happens, your blood sugar levels are going to be better controlled. And then that leads to helping reduce the onset of um, diabetes, type two diabetes, as well as um, cardiovascular risk. Risk. And then um, I did put on here, it may reduce inflammatory responses within the um, fat tissue and compared to a diet higher in saturated fat. So adipose tissue or fat tissue, uh, that is kind of a hot spot for inflammatory responses to happen um, through different mechanisms. Um, cytokines is a, a type of protein or pro-inflammatory protein. And so they have found that that, um, that fat tissue is kind of, again, kind of a hot spot for this chronic inflammation to occur. And if uh, we can reduce some of that saturated fat from the diet and replace it with the monounsaturated fat, the inflammatory response within that of post tissue or fat tissue decreases, which is um, a great benefit. Okay. Let me answer the one question. <laughs> no, we have one more question. Let me answer, I'm going into the question about are all oils equal? Is one better than the other? So um, how much um, oil uh, is, is good or uh, monounsaturated fat? 
Um, going back again to the MIND diet, it specifically says two tablespoons daily of extra virgin olive oil. Um, so with extra virgin olive oil, olive oil does have a compound in it that's very special to olive oil. And it is a, um, it, it acts similar to ibuprofen. Um, and uh, I can't pronounce the name right now. It, it starts with an O and it's a long, long name, tongue twister, but it has the same, they're showing that it has the same effect um, as ibuprofen does with helping control inflammation or reduce inflammation in the body that is specific to olive oil or olives. Um, and so I think there is something there when, when you're looking at it from, from that angle. Now, Mediterranean diet recommendations are just 35 to 40% total calories coming from fat, majority of it coming from unsaturated sources. That's a pretty broad, um, broad, I guess, recommendation or, or uh, kind of uh, unclear, like, oh, well, how, how, what does that translate into? And that one is a little bit hard to translate because then you know, you need to know how many calories you need to consume in the day and then translate that into grams of fat and then translate that into grams of fat into serving food. So there are several steps to, to that, but there, there has been um, very large studies out there, very reputable and respected studies that have shown that canola oil has cardiovascular benefits. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that uh, it's hard to say one is better than the other. I can just say that the MIND diet in particular for cognitive health, they specifically used extra virgin olive oil. Um, Mediterranean diet, they have a more uh, broad recommendation of um, you know, unsaturated fat sources via mono and polyunsaturated fats, which all of these are excellent sources of. So um, it almost more depends on how you're, how you're going to utilize the oil and the smoke point. That's very important. And that's probably one of the most important things with oil is that you need to understand um, and know where the smoke point is because any oil, no matter if it's a healthy um, unsaturated oil or a saturated oil, you need to understand where that smoke point is because when you heat oils to a certain degree, then they're gonna denature. Um, they're going to go from a cis form to a trans form. That's where like trans fat comes from. So you're gonna denature those cis molecules into a trans molecule and compound, carbon compound. And, and then it's going to not be beneficial to your health at that point. So the smoke point, the heat, the amount of heat that you put on the oils are all very important. And um, I know with people have questions about, well, expelled, um, cold press, refined. Again, that kind of goes back to if it's cold press, then, then you probably, again, really check the, the smoke point on it, the heat um, uh, on it, because it's, usually cold press can't tolerate as much heat. And so I wouldn't recommend cooking at high temperatures with it because you're gonna denature the molecules at that point. And it's not gonna have the health, you know, the healthful benefits as if it was kept at a, a cooler temperature. Whereas, you know, a refined oil that has been heat treated uh, can withstand higher temperatures. So if you're cooking at higher temperatures, you know those molecules will um, be stable and and uh, not denature, and you can still get some of those health benefits. So that's kind of what I recommend with with oil to um, um, really understand the the smoke point um, and utilize it appropriately. Okay, we have another question. Yeah, the question was just if peanut butter or other nut butters are also a good source of monounsaturated fats. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so peanut, um, I have peanut oil right here. So peanut oil is gonna be a good source of monounsaturated fats, peanut butter, um, monounsaturated fats, good source. Yeah, so peanuts are, are um, a good source and um, other nuts, well, peanuts are, are technically a legume, confusing, 
with uh, nuts in the in the name, but um, pecans and pistachios, cashews, uh, those are all really good sources of monounsaturated fat. Okay, now we're gonna go into the recipe. So it's our fennel radicchio um, and endive salad with a Dijon vinaigrette. So I'm gonna start with the, the fennel. I did do a couple steps before we, we started, but um, you wanna pick off the uh, fronds, which I, I did most of that, but that's these little feathery things up here. And you actually want to, if, if some of them have a little bit thicker stem on them, you can do a rough chop but um it's really pretty in the salad and you can like garnish it with it but it just makes it really pretty um in there and then you want to cut off the stalks and nothing's going to go to waste i mean a little bit off the end but everything else is going to go into the salad and with fennel we kind of lighted this a few um Last one. But with fennel, it's a really nice licorice. If you if you like licorice flavor, um, it has a really nice licorice crunch to it. I'm short and I need a need a step still. So we're gonna just slice those up into nice small pieces and then add salad and fennel is a great source of vitamin c um, it also has a antioxidant very potent antioxidant quercetin uh, so it's a good source of those and uh, manganese manganese is an important mineral in bone health development and and bone health in general so great nutrient dense vegetable. Okay, so I'm just going to cut off the ends here. And then we're just going to thinly slice the bulb. And if you want a top, top down view, our how to video is all top down. So you can maybe have a better view of what's going on. Another great how-to video that I think is really important, probably one of the most essential things when you're, you're cooking is to have a sharp knife. And so our chef, um, Sam Maggi, he has a couple how-to videos on how to sharpen your knife and hone your knife. Uh, so I do recommend if you're, if you're curious about how to sharpen your knife, um, to watch those how-to videos on our website. Okay, so radicchio, I'm just gonna cut that in half and then I'm just gonna take out the center. And I just did a little triangle cut there and we're gonna thinly slice it. And again, with the radicchio, anthocyanins right here, the red purple color, it's really makes a beautiful salad with the green and the purple. Okay, now the endive, um, there's four, the recipe calls for, I already cut up three. And with these, you just want to um, cut in half and then just lay out and then you're gonna thinly slice like all the others. So this recipe is pretty much just chopping. It's a nice spring salad. Um, and fantastic if you want to hit all the nutrients we talked about. If you serve this with a just a really simple grilled salmon with 
I love grilled salmon with lemon juice. That's my favorite way. It's really simple, but um, I, I love it that way. But serving it with a grilled salmon um, filet, then you have all the three nutrients that we, we talked about um, in a meal. So next thing I'm gonna do is do the um, Dijon vinaigrette. And we're just gonna use a mason jar. I love mixing salad dressing in mason jars because you don't have to lug out the blender. Uh, it's just a lot easier in my opinion. So we're gonna add so olive oil. So a half a cup of olive oil, great in monounsaturated fat. Okay. Three tablespoons of uh, red wine vinegar. Then we have some Dijon mustard. It's a teaspoon. I'm just gonna kind of eyeball it. I kind of have this rule of thumb is uh, I count to three seconds for a tablespoon. So I'm gonna count to one and a half seconds. And that's about a, a teaspoon. So I don't have to, uh, to wash it. And then uh, for salt, we have a fourth of a teaspoon of salt. Fourth of a teaspoon of cracked pepper. Okay. And then I'm just gonna shake that up. Make sure I got everything in there. Oh, need a garlic clove, which is over here. Let me grab that real quick. So a garlic clove. I'm just gonna mince it. Now, if you wanna, if you're gonna be peeling a lot of garlic, I do recommend putting garlic in a little cup of warm water for you know a few minutes, and that will really help loosen up the skin for you. So it's easy to peel, and it won't stick all over your your hands. So just add the garlic cloves directly to a warm cup of water, and they're much easier to peel. Okay, so we're just gonna mince the garlic. And then add the mixer. Okay, now we're gonna shake it up. Now with this, if you feel like this is a lot of dressing, you know, just customize it. You don't have to use it all. So I'm gonna bring the bowl over here and kind of show you what it looks like before I start mixing. Okay. This bowl might not be big enough, but we'll make it work. Okay. So I'm just gonna toss it around a little bit. Now I'm gonna add, I toasted about a fourth of a cup of walnuts. So walnuts are going to be, one of the nuts that are really great in omega-3 fatty acids, the ALA. So we're gonna add those into the salad. And then um, a half a cup, or you can do a fourth of a cup to a half a cup of, of cheese. It does call for gorgonzola. I'm not a huge gorgonzola fan. So you can replace it with feta. I, I enjoy feta better. So I'm just gonna sprinkle that on. And again, it's customizable. If you don't wanna use as much, you don't. Don't have to, or the type of cheese if you prefer something different or no cheese at all, you can do that as well. So we got the dressing all mixed up and I'm gonna start with half. And then I'm going to toss it and see how that looks. I think I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit more in because the uh, the fennel and the enzymes that I got were pretty were pretty big. So I think I need a little bit more to go in there. So I'm just going to just a little bit more, maybe not all of it. Okay. 
such a pretty salad and colorful. And just kind of reviewing again with all of the uh, nutrients that we covered and what's in the salad. So the, the radicchio has the anthocyanins, uh, walnuts have the ALA omega-3 fatty acids, and the olive oil and the monounsaturated fats. So we're hitting all three. But like I said, if you want to serve it with a, um, another rich omega-3 fatty acid source, then just doing a simple grilled salmon filet would go perfect with the salad. So let me go ahead and plate so you can see it. So it's a, it's a very beautiful and nutrient-rich anti-inflammatory salad. Okay, so that concludes the presentations. I do want to talk about our upcoming classes. Uh, we have um, the class schedule right there for the rest of the month of April. We have several culinary ones coming up if you're interested in learning what a pasty is, then that's on the 7th. Our roasted chicken with bread salad is going to be on the 14th. Spring pasta is on the 21st. And then vegan power bowl is on the 28th. So you can sign up for those on our website or via Eventbrite. They're both locations. And then I really encourage you to get out to one of our five locations in the Portland area. Grab, like I said, grab one of our recipe cards. We have actually 12 out there. Uh, for for this month. So um, there's a lot of fantastic options out there that you can grab or visit our website. If you don't have um, a chance to come to one of our stores or live in the area, visit our website, grab these recipes, watch our how-to videos, um, and yeah, learn, you know, learn different recipes, get in the kitchen and cook more uh, helpful meals. And then I'm just gonna ask one more time for any questions before we conclude. Oh. You had mentioned that the refined oils are good for a higher smoke point. What would the use case or benefit be of a cold press oil? Cold press salad. So uh, cold press oil, like I said, it does gonna depend. There's, there's actually a lot of oils out there. There's um, hemp oil, there's uh, walnut oil, there's different, yeah, different types of nut oils out there. And, and so if they're cold pressed, they're more than likely going to have a lower smoke point. They're not going to tolerate a lot of heat before they denature. Uh, so those type of oils are going to be more appropriate for cooler um, recipes like salads that don't have any heat or something that has a short um, uh, cook time. Um, so, in a low temperature. So those are, uh, yeah, ways to use that cold press. And then uh, for the expelled or the refined, those are going to be more tolerable for higher heat um, levels. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, they, they have their place and consuming a variety is a good direction to go with that. But, okay, well, thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you hopefully next